think there are quite a few who haven't uh, made it past the screens as yet. Uh, but uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a new Lord's Day. It's a new week. And uh, it's a new opportunity to worship God, to realign ourselves with him following the undoubted um, slight detours that we may have had over the past week. So as we prepare for worship this morning, uh, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father, we thank you for the many, many blessings that you have showered upon us during the past week. Sometimes, Father, we know that we miss them. We don't notice them. But as we look back over that past week, Father, we uh, thank you for bringing us through the week, for guiding us, for keeping us safe and secure. Father, we thank you especially to that we can see Adam here this morning, that he's doing well despite having quite a serious health uh, problem with his lung. We thank you, Father, that uh, he is here today. We thank you also that Anne's uh, eye surgery was successful and that she uh, sees with uh, much greater clarity. And Father, there are others of us who have struggled in different ways, who have had challenges, who have felt we had mountains to climb. Yet we are here, Father, and we thank you that you give us the strength, the determination, and the enthusiasm to worship you this morning. So as we come to this place, Father, we ask that you would guide us in the time that we spent together. Help us to put away from our minds thoughts which would be distracting. Yet we know there are many difficulties throughout the world, and particularly we think of the uh, huge earthquake in uh, Turkey and Syria. And we ask that your love may be amongst those who are, particularly those who have uh, lost loved ones and who are struggling now. Uh, be with them, Father, and give them strength. May they turn to you and put their trust in you, for there's little else they can do, and there's little else which will help them forward. Father, we thank you that despite the awful things that happen in this world, we can have a sure hope without a shadow of doubt, that we have your promise, your promise of a life after this, a life of perfection, a life which has no sadness, no harm, but a life which will be forever beautiful and sweet. We thank you for that, Father, and as we come together this morning to sing your praises, to approach you in prayer, to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus, and to be encouraged, we ask that you would linger with us. Open our hearts, Lord. Help us to have joy this morning. In Jesus' pray, name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. If you're using your songbooks, we're singing song number 578. And if you will, please be upstanding as we sing, We Will Glorify. <clears throat> We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will 
have the Old and New Testament reading this morning. Morning, church. Reading from Psalm 22, verse 12 to 21. Psalm 22, verse 12, 21. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Basham have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths. They are raging, roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joints. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. The wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, I hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. Amen. The New Testament reading is from Revelation 22, verses 12 through 17. That's Revelation 22, verses 12 through 17. Jesus testifies to the churches. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Song number 18, next, Faithful Love. And after this song, we will have the prayer for the church this morning. Song number 18. <laughs> Faithful love blowing down from the porch, the crowd makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love comes each fear, reaches down, rises.
Good morning. Let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful and it's a privilege, Father, to be here today, to be able to freely talk to you, to listen to your word, and to sing praises to your name, and just to give glory to your name. Father, they say that the children are the future, and, and this is true. And that's why, Father, here in Cumbernauld, your church here, we are so lucky that we have so many young ones who has the passion to know you more, who has the passion to grow knowing you, knowing Jesus. Father, be with us, young ones. Let, let them be a good influence to, to their parents in the house, in their school, in their circle of friends. Father, in particular, we bring before you now Logan, young Logan. Father, who has been coming to, to service, to Tuesday Club, to Teen Calf. And perhaps, Father, he's just coming so that he can have fun with his friends, to see his friends. And Father, we know that the seed has been planted in there. And that as he continue to, to pursuit of knowing you, bless him, Father. And the many young ones that we have here. Not just them, Father, but bless their families as well. Especially, again, in, in Logan's situation where it's in his family. <clears throat> It's, it's only him that's, um, that has the, the, the courage to pursue you. Be with him. Give him more strength. And use us in any way possible to encourage him. To be there for him. To comfort him in his time of needs. Father, be with us now as we continue to worship you. Be with <clears throat> the many brothers and sisters all around the world at this time who's worshiping you as well. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Before we come around the Lord's table this morning, let's look, uh, turn to song number 269. Thomas's song. Song number 269. Jesus, you were all to me. Why did you die on Calvary? Oh, Lamb of God, I fail to see. How this could be part of the plan. They say that you are alive again, but I saw them and everything reach out to play and back his way. How could this be part of If I could only go over and touch the scars where nails were 
fact is a thing that is known or proved to be true, or information used as evidence or as part of a report or news article. A feeling <laughs> as an emotional state or reaction, or an idea or belief, especially a vague or irrational one. And bearing that in mind, I've seen a video recently of a Christian apologist who was reacting to another video of a famous YouTuber who said these words. He said, he was talking about his walk as being a Christian, and he said, so when I took what the Bible was coordinating me to do um, on this earth, and I actually followed it, I realized that my life was substantially better it helped me out significantly. And the Christian apologist replies to it and says, George, I love that Christianity has helped you in your life in so many ways. And I think that God has designed us in a certain way that when we orient our lives towards him, we flourish. But I think we also have to be careful because the Bible talked a lot about suffering. Pick up your cross and follow me. I want to make sure that we don't give the message that people should become Christians because it makes our life better. I think there is only one reason anybody should become a Christian, because it's true. And, I was, and as I was preparing for the Lord's Supper, um, it got me thinking about facts versus feelings. You see, when we come to the Lord's table, different thoughts and, different thoughts and feelings go through our heads. I feel as though I'm not worthy to partake because I committed a sin yesterday, last night, this morning. I feel as though God should have just made the world without sin so that Jesus wouldn't have to suffer. I feel so relieved that Jesus died because now I can go to heaven. I feel this. I feel that. Yeah, you can have feelings about certain things. But your feelings shouldn't cloud the facts. You see, the facts are this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. 
he created them male and female. God created you and I in his image. And he loved us so much that he gave us free will. Now, free will is the power of acting without constraint of necessity or fate, the ability to act at one's own discretion. The facts are that God limited his power and gave us free will. Now, you might feel as though that was silly of God or doesn't really make sense, but he done it to demonstrate his love so that you and I could love. Because in order to truly love, you need to be free to do so. Now, as you know, the facts are that we use our free will not to acknowledge, accept, and love God, but rather acknowledge, accept, and love ourselves. And you can see that being so, so rampant today. And however you feel about that, it doesn't change the facts. We see it throughout history and the Old Testament, groups of people and individuals who who done this, and we see it today. And as I said, however you feel about it, doesn't change the fact. The fact being that Christ died for every single one of them. The fact is that God is a just and fair God. And he sort of puts himself in a dilemma here. Because though he's fair and just, he knows that someone's got to pay the price for the, the sins that have been committed. But he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to suffer the price. And the fact is that he sent his son to suffer the price and to die for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, you might have your feelings about this. I feel as though that was wrong of God to do. I'm, I'm a nobody. Why did Christ die for me? I didn't even know him. And sometimes I choose to not even acknowledge him. It doesn't make sense to me. In Romans chapter 5, verse 7, it says, For rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone may even dare to die. Whether and however you may feel, it doesn't change the facts. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that fact does not change. You might have feelings and thoughts running through your head right now. We, we do, we're human beings. But the truth still stands. <coughs> Let's pray this time. Father, we come before you just to have a couple of minutes, Father, just to reflect on that sacrifice that was made for us. That sacrifice that means so much. Because, Father, without it, we're hopeless. Without it, Life is meaningless, Father. We're so thankful and so grateful for that sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We're so thankful for it, that those are the facts, Father, that that is the truth. And Father, many emotions and thoughts and feelings might go through our heads, but the truth is you love us so much, Father, that you died on our behalf that you suffered, you were mocked, you were beaten on our behalf, Father. I pray, Father, that you forgive us for our sins. Father, we pray to you for, you help us never to forget, 
never to let our feelings cloud the truth. Never let the opinions of the world cloud the truth. Never let the opinions of our selfish emotions cloud the truth, Father. But your love is far greater than what we've ever known. Father, we pray for the bread as symbol of the body. That body that was pierced. That body that was beaten. That body that was spat upon. On our behalf, Father. Pray to bless the bread and bless every head that's bowed. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear God, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for everything you do for us. Please bless us in this coming week and be with us, guide us, and help us to make the right choices. We hope that we can learn from the sermon and we can be your servants. In Jesus' name we pray.
I'll end with First Corinthians chapter 15. And it says, I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to, to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether, whether then, as is I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, 
how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God, that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. Amen. Before we have the sermon reading followed by the sermon, we'll sing song number 718, We Shall Assemble. We'll sing this song through twice. Song number 718. Apologies for not marking that up this twice. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the sermon reading this morning is from Acts 2, 46 and 47. And it reads, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. For years I've used the New King James Version, and this year, last year, I changed over very end of last year when I got back. I changed over to the ESV. I know Adam's been using it for a number of years, and it's become more common in the Bibles that we hand out. It's much easier to get hold of. When I was in 
the school in America, when I studied there for two years, we had to use the new, the, uh, the old King James Version, the original. In fact, when I started preaching in Sight Hill, uh, that was the Bible I had to use until I got to 1 Corinthians 8, and then I didn't understand anything that was being said, so I changed over to the new King James. But I've made the decision to change because of a couple of things I found out. And one of them, which I didn't realize until this week, is Acts 2, verse 47. Because there in the Acts 2, verse 47, at the very end of it, in the New King James, it says, and the Lord was adding daily to the church those who were being saved. It says something almost identical in the King James Version. But it's not in the original text. It's supposed to be what Roddy read, or what the ESV says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In fact, the word church, or the Greek word, if you're interested, is ekklesia. We get words like uh, the ecclesiastical courts, or the you know, ecclesiastic, or the ecclesi I forget what else they call it, the ecclesiastic clerics, or whatever they call them. But anyway, that's the word that we get from it, ecclesia. It doesn't appear in the book of Acts until chapter 5, verse 11, when Ananias and Sapphira die, and great fear came upon all the church. First time it's mentioned in the book of Acts. First time it's mentioned is by Jesus in Matthew 16. I will build my church. And then he repeats it again two chapters later when he says about the unrepentant brother, he won't hear you, take him, take a matter to the church. And that's the only time it's mentioned in the Gospels, and it's not mentioned again until Acts chapter 5.11. So I just wanted to get the technical thing out of the way. But what is interesting is, is that although this idea of adding to the church, and the reason it's in the King James and the New King James is because they use what's known as the received text, which was the established document of the Bible that the church used from about the fourth century up until certainly the 17th century and even beyond that. I still use it today, of course, in the New King James. But we've uncovered so many more documents. We've dug up so many more archaeological bits of pottery with scriptures on them and bits of parchment with scriptures on them. They would now realize that the earliest this really appears is about two to three hundred. So Luke didn't write added to the church. But that's what he understood when he wrote added to their number. Although it's not called the church until Acts chapter 5, verse 11, and although Jesus spoke about it, we don't hear about it until Acts chapter 5, verse 11, and then it recurs a number of times throughout the book of Acts, and certainly throughout Paul's collection of letters. It's certainly what Luke had in mind when he says, the Lord added to their number. The number of what? Number of people in, in what? In the church. So it doesn't belong in the original text, but it's certainly what Luke had in mind. Another factor just to consider before we really get into this lesson is the context of what's happened here. We've got the guilt of people in, summed up in the sermon that Peter gives. In Acts chapter 22, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. There is a sense of guilt that belongs to all of humanity because of what our sin, as Edwin has brought to our remembrance this morning through the Lord's Supper, did to the Son of God. He came to die, and he took upon him the price of our sin in order that we might be saved. And at the end of it, in verse 37, and Adam covered this last time he was preaching, was, what do we do? How do we respond to this? In fact, it's a similar statement that's made by Paul, or Saul, as he's known at the time, on the road to Damascus. There he is, traveling down the road to Damascus, when he encounters the risen Savior in a vision. And the first thing he says is, who are you, Lord? which is interesting because he acknowledges that this is something of the divine when he uses that idea of Lord. He's connecting this vision to his version of the burning bush, if you will, that Moses had in Exodus 3. There's something of the divine here. And when he revealed himself, when Jesus said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, and it's hard for you to kick against the goads, you know, you're persecuting my people, but something's bothering you about this stuff. The only thing that Saul had to ask then was, what do you want me to do? And it's the same question that's asked in Acts 2.37, and the response, as Adam 
highlighted for us when he spoke on this in Acts 2.30 is repent and let every one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And to do that in the name of Christ, just because I missed that wee bit out, I'll put it back in there. And the consequence of that is they started worshipping God. And they started praising God and they started getting together as God's people in this newfound community of a number of people beginning with 3,000 and growing from there. There was a community of Christians, people who realized that they had done something awful and wanted to correct it and realized they couldn't and relied upon the grace of God in order, in order to make that correction. And all they could do was share what they had and praise God and give thanks. And in verses 46 and 47 that Ronnie read for us, appreciate you step in for Collins, who asked for cover today. They went to the temple because that's what they'd always known. When you want to go and worship God, the temple is the, the center of your life. And that wasn't just wrenched, wrenched out of them because they'd now become Christians. They broke bread in each other's homes and they fellowshiped. They received their food with gladness and generous hearts. They praised God. And I love this last statement that Luke puts in there, having favor with all the people. You see, as he goes on and says the Lord was adding to their number, the community of Christ is growing in that early church. It's expanding and soon it will break out of Jerusalem. It will reach into the surrounding regions of Judea. Within a few years, Philip will be on his way down to Samaria and sending for Peter and John to come down and impart spiritual gifts to the new brethren there. And then the next thing you know, well, they're going to the rest of the world. And that's the reason Saul gets called in Acts chapter 9 and why Cornelius is the first of the Gentile converts in Acts chapter 10. And Peter brings them in and acknowledges that Jew and Gentile have equal standing before God in this community. But it wasn't a community that was just pleasing to God. It was a community that was pleasing to the wider community in which we live. It was a community that went beyond the walls of a building or beyond the prayers in a congregation or the remembrance of the Lord on the first day of the week when they broke bread and took of the fruit of the vine. It was a community that touched the lives of other people. In fact, if you go into the next chapter and just follow straight into it, when Peter and John were going up to the temple, they met a lame man and said, we don't have gold or silver, but what we do have is take up your bed and walk in the name of Jesus. And one of the things, Joseph Fitzmaier is one of the commentators that's uh, well known for writing about the book of Acts, makes this observation that the key to what Luke is writing is what he calls the life-changing Christ event. These are a group of people who have met Jesus, and their lives are changed forever. The slate's wiped clean. The book is purged of all its ink, of you know, all, the, all the sin that is written there in ink, if you will. And the pages are fresh to be written upon. And chapter one begins with, call me Christian. And our lives live in this, and that's what's going on here. And every... For everyone here in this chapter in Acts 2 and everything that follows and everything that really the New Testament, for that matter, the entirety of the Bible is talking about is when you meet Christ, when you embrace Christ, when you become a Christian, when you are forgiven of your sins and added to the body of believers that we are here on this first day of the week. What does that mean to you? To be amongst one another, but to know it's because of Jesus. And if we really want to get into the heart of this, if we really want to understand not only the impact this had on them as a community of believers, but how they were able to make the impact on their surrounding community, which would go on to persecute them in Acts chapter 8, with the, uh, in the wake of Stephen's death in Acts chapter 7. And it actually started, when you actually go down into chapters, well, chapter four, really, that's when it really kicks off with Peter and John. But the whole church starts getting persecuted after the murder of Stephen. You begin to realize that Luke, who writes the book of Acts, is writing this as a continuation, obviously, if you know anything about your New Testament, 
of the Gospel of Luke. He writes the Gospel of Luke, he writes the Book of Acts, and it's a continuation. But both of them have this central theme of the Christ event. People who made Jesus were changed forever because of it. So let's go back to the book of Luke. Now I've got some notes here, and I'm not planning to go behind the pulpit, but if I turn around and look at these, just to remind myself, but hopefully we can get this, because I think there's a number of incidents, and here's the deal with the book of Luke. It's full of this, so we don't have time to cover every single one of them. But as we go through this, we want to build up this picture that Luke is creating for us, that when people met Jesus, something was changing. They were changing. <clears throat> they were affected by it. Many of the incidents that Luke records are for their good. Some of them, not so much. There were enemies. At the end of it, of course, Jesus is betrayed and crucified and all that went with that. But Luke has this paramount within his book. When people started meeting Jesus, good things started to affect them. Changes started to happen. Yes, there is suffering. But there is no better, to, better life to live than the one that is lived in the shadow of the cross or in the light of the gospel, for that matter. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 14, Jesus is born. Shepherds are on their hills by night looking after their flocks. We know the hymns. We know the carols. We sing the songs. We've heard them sung. And in verse 14, it says, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. He's just been born, and already a blessing is pronounced upon the whole earth. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. This baby, born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and already a promise is uttered that he is the one that reconciles us to God, can restore us to God, can bring us back into a relationship with God. And already we're seeing the glimpses of a community. There's the community of his family. His mum and dad are there. There's the community of foreigners. The, eventually the wise men will come down and visit the infant Jesus. And there is the community of the outcasts, the, the shepherds. The guys that stunk of sheep, if you had the chance to see the Chosen, the pilot episode that we started off the Chosen when we looked at that last year, it's the story of the shepherds who came to see the newborn king and who heard this expression, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And they were rejected because sheep kind of stink. And people that look after sheep smell like sheep, and you don't kind of want to be around people that smell like sheep. And they stayed out of the communities. They were generally set aside. And uh, there was maybe some ritual uncleanness associated with it in some respects. And I love the video that Adam chose. It was late in the week before it could get out. But the video that he chose was, I'm not worthy. I'm not useful. I can't do it. My heart is full of sin. I have failed. And the response from God is always the same. Be mine. And from the very beginning of his arrival in the earth, that's the message that God sent out through his son. Peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. And if he can be pleased with the shepherds that everybody else kind of avoids because of the stink, I guess. I feel like I'm being very unfair to shepherds here, but in general, if we ever have elders and we call them shepherds, do not think that they stink. But if they do, it's because they smell like you. So just bear that in mind if that ever comes your way. Already there is a difference happening in the lives. And it started with a baby. Luke goes on, he keeps talking about different things. In the next uh, section of this chapter, he's taken up to be dedicated to the Lord. He's the firstborn. So there are rules, if you go back and read Leviticus and Numbers, there are rules about the firstborn child. The firstborn child needs to be redeemed. The child that opens up the matrix of the womb is one of the expressions that's used in Torah has to be redeemed. And so Jesus is the one who has opened up the womb of Mary, and so he has to be redeemed. And so they take him down to the Lord to dedicate him to him, and you redeem them through a sacrifice, through a gift that you give to God, so you can keep your child 
and the Levites take their place in the service of God at the temple. When he gets there, he encounters a very old man called Simeon. And this is what Simeon says. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. So what Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation. So that's a beautiful thing to say. My eyes have seen your salvation. And I can almost imagine tears in the eyes of Simeon as he says this, as he blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. A sword will pierce through your own soul also. He's still an infant. But here's a man who's content to just go now. I'm ready. I've seen what I was waiting for. Let me go. Jesus grows up. He eventually follows in the steps of, so to speak, of John the Baptist, who prepares his way. And he begins his ministry. And really, chapter four is where it starts to kick off. And this is where the texts just start with flowing in rapidly. I'm not even going to read them all. I'm just going to kind of touch on a few points in each one. For example, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 31, Jesus encounters the man with the unclean demon. Now, people would avoid people with demons for good reason. There are stories in, in the New Testament of demons that would cause a child to be thrown into the fire. There's legion who is chained but can't be chained, and he lives in a cave out in the gatherings. And the people are terrified of him. Even when he has the demon cast out, people are even more terrified now of Jesus that he has this kind of power to cast out these demons. And yet it says, down in verse uh, 35, Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And I want you to notice in verse 37, reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Because that reminds me a little bit of what it says in Acts 2, 46 and 47. Receiving favor from the people, treated with respect by the community of the, Jew of the Jewish world for these Christians that had found them. But here, Jesus, what would it mean to a man who has this demon cast out to have encountered Jesus? He gets to be with his family. He gets to be in his village again. He gets to go to the temple again. He gets to praise God again, all because he met Jesus. goes on and talks about the many other miracles that Jesus did in that particular area. When you go down into chapter 5, verse 12, it talks about how Jesus cleansed the lep leper. Notice in verse 13 that Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. There's a Christ event that was transformative and spoke of so much love. Touching the leper meant you were unclean. You had to go through a ritual cleansing process. You had to go and you know, maybe make a sacrifice, if I remember correctly, from Leviticus. Whenever you encountered leprosy, you came in contact with it. And of course, the risk was you might catch leprosy, although leprosy is a lot harder to catch than we think. But what would it have meant to this man who had no physical contact with anyone other than lepers? Who, because of his leprosy, leprosy is one of these diseases that destroys the nerve endings in your body. So you lose sensation. So you hurt yourself. You don't realize you've hurt yourself. An abscess sets in, rot sets in. And leprosy is associated with bits of you falling off if it advances far enough. So even if somebody was touching you, you might not even realize it because your body's dead on the outside. But he knew it when Jesus touched. And when he was touched by Jesus, it transformed 
everything. He heals a paralytic, totally dependent in the next paragraph on others to help him get around and do things. And at the end of the day, what do his friends do? They pick him up, they carry him, they can't get in, they go upstairs, they dig a hole in the roof, they lower him down and he's basically saying, would you do something for a friend, please? Now, there's a guy who didn't mind falling down a hole. And Jesus healed him and praised his friends for the support that he gave them. Was his life changed? Was his life altered? Again and again it occurs. In chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, there's a man with a weathered hand, and he heals him on the Sabbath. It's not enough that this man needs healed. It's got to be done immediately, even though it's the Sabbath, and of course Jesus is opposed, and there's this interaction that the two of them have, and his hand is restored. Some are furious about it, but others are discussing what they might do with Jesus. And others are just in awe of what this man, this son of God is doing. And that's how the book of Luke continues. There's a wonderful passage in John chapter, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 7 that continues talks about the centurion servant. And here's a man who's a Gentile. Here's a man who comes from a pagan background. Here's a man who is there as an occupying force. Scott's left. But if you get the chance to ask Scott, ask him how it goes with hearts and minds. This was an expression that the British Army used in Basra with regard to the Iraq War. It was an expression that was used in Afghanistan during the Helmand province when Britain was there as part of the force that was dealing with the issues in Afghanistan after the 9-11 incident. And the expression that kicked around was hearts and minds. We're trying to win <laughs> hearts and minds. The Romans weren't there to win hearts and minds. They were there to win. They were there to make sure their enemy was crushed and knew it. To get what they wanted out of the local community to extort and draw taxes out of them as much as they could squeeze. And yet, in that community that hated and resented the Romans, one lived his life in such a way that the elders of the Jews were willing to do anything he asked because he built them a synagogue, because he loved God. There's no indication that this man's Jewish. In fact, quite the opposite is the case, because when Jesus goes down to the centurion's house, beginning in verse 6, and it goes on. He refuses to let Jesus under his roof because I'm not worthy. Why? I'm not Jewish. What he's saying, I'm a Gentile. You can't come in. I know and respect your law. And your law says, if you come in here, you'll be unclean. And I'm not going to let you do that. But it is enough if you just say the word. Whatever you say will come to pass. And Jesus goes on and praises this man. When he heard these things, he marveled at the centurion, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, down in verse 9 and 10, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. This is a remarkable encounter, because now we're talking about the Gentiles. A, a woman would come to Jesus asking for help, but she's not Jewish, she's a Gentile. I think she's from Tyre or Sidon, one of those cities up the coast, a Phoenician. And Jesus would say to her, I've not come to help your law. I'm here to help the Jewish people, the, Israel, the Hebrews, the Israelites. And she says, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs from the master's table. Oh, such faith. Such faith have I seen. And he acknowledges and responds to that. In the next paragraph, he raises a widow's son. You go on a little bit further and uh, Verse 36 and following, there is a woman who comes in to Simon the Pharisee's house and she starts uh, washing his feet with her tears and she starts drying his feet with her hair. And Simon is asked a question by Jesus because he's thinking, if you knew who she was, you wouldn't let her anywhere near you. And, and Jesus is thinking, if you knew who I was, you'd understand that anybody can, can come near me. What's Jesus saying? Be mine. There's nothing but ourselves that can keep us from Jesus. He calms the storm, what power he has over nature. He heals a man with another demon in chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. This is the one of Legion with the 5,000. And on and on it goes. He heals, women's, uh, he heals a woman of her issue of blood. He heals Jairus' daughter. 
at the end of chapter eight, all these different incidents, on and on it goes, every, not quite every chapter, but throughout the book of Luke, on and on it goes. And you get right down to chapter 18. And there towards the end of chapter 18, he, he encounters a beggar. Some would say it's, I forget if it's this passing, it's actually in Mark where he's identified as Bartimaeus. And he heals a man who was blind and he gives him his sight back. And then he goes in chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, to the home of Zacchaeus. Why does he go to the home of Zacchaeus? Because for this reason, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. And, and salvation has been restored to the house of Zacchaeus because why? Jesus was the encounter that changed Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' words go on to explain, if I have defrauded anyone, I will repay them. If I, I give out half, I think it's half, he says, everything that I have, I give half the poor, half to the poor, rather, in verse 8. Why? Because he's met Jesus. We go on a little bit further into chapter 23. And we see perhaps one of the most dramatic, emotional experiences of an encounter with Christ. I think we need to read this. Look at chapter 23, beginning in verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other, who had earlier rebuked him, incidentally, at the beginning of the crucifixion, had rebuked Jesus, had cursed Jesus, had slandered Jesus, along with the, the unrepentant criminal. He rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say today, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is a man who in his fury when he was being nailed to the cross and hoisted up in front of a virulent, vitriolic crowd, was joining in with the slandering of Jesus, who witnessed something in the loss, the losing of Jesus' life, the gradual loss of life that was ebbing from him. He'd been beaten, he'd been scourged, his body was torn apart by the whip. And here he was now, losing the last breaths of his life, and in that six hours or so of crucifixion, this man looked at Jesus and realized this is different. It's so different. I don't want to be hateful and angry, even though I feel like I've got every right to be as I, I'm hoisted upon this cross. And he turns to Jesus, and I can almost imagine him begging, barely audible, his voice cracking as he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Forgive me. And Jesus' response could be summed up in the words of that video. Be mine. It's never too late. Unless death has come. And then it is. And so about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sunlight failed, sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man is innocent. I've never really appreciated, I've never appreciated this before, but what Luke does in his gospel is book in the most amazing story. A baby is born and the outcasts, the shepherds come and praise God that the Messiah has arrived and they were the ones that were called to witness the arrival of the Messiah to see this newborn baby who would carry upon himself the restoration of God's people. And then wise men from a foreign land who had traveled for months 
following a star that guided them to Bethlehem, would come to the place where Jesus was living as an infant and give thanks and praise to God, even though they were Gentiles. And in his death, a criminal, an outcast, a condemned man, comes to Jesus just like the shepherds to give his praise to God, to seek the forgiveness and to realize the redemption that God is giving to the world through his son. And a Gentile who witnesses the death of Christ, just as they had witnessed, other Gentiles had witnessed the arrival of Christ in the earth. Another one gets to witness the departure of the Messiah from this earth and says, truly this man was righteous. Mark's gospel, I think, says it best, for me at least, the point of this lesson, truly this man was the son of God. A righteous man. And so with that in mind, when you turn the page, and really Luke should be the last of the Gospels if you want to do it sequentially. Luke should flow into Acts. Seems like a good way of doing it. They don't do it that way, but it seems like that's what probably was originally intended. Luke probably had his volume one, volume two, story of Jesus, the story of Jesus walking with his people that he had redeemed. Is it any surprise to us that these people who went to Jesus to see him, to hear his words being spoken by Peter and James and John and the others there on the day of Pentecost, that they should ask, what do we do? And Peter's response is, Jesus says, be mine that they would go on to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers and that all would come upon every soul and that their standing in the community would reflect the glory of God's work through the number of people that would, become to be, that would come to be known as the church, the way. Is there any wonder that others wanted to be part of this and be added to it. Because what started with 12 men, what continued with 3,000 converts? And there were a number of other people that were in there. So let's, David doesn't need to get a spreadsheet out and start calculating the numbers for us. But when we start looking at how these people were changing because they had encountered Christ, is it any surprise that others wanted to be added to the church because brethren these were contagious christians because they had come in contact with jesus they had taken into themselves the holy spirit because he was offered to them as a gift from god as recognition for their obedience The Holy Spirit enlivens and drives this young church. He's the continuation of the work of Jesus. If the Gospel of Luke is what Jesus did while he walked in Galilee, Judea, and Samaria, and other places, then Acts is the continuation of his work through the Spirit in us to the rest of the world. And if individuals who encountered Jesus were so transformed by that experience, what's going to happen to our communities beyond these walls when those individuals encounter Jesus through us? When we go to our neighbors and say to them, and I know, Yvonne, you've done this, and say to them, Do you mind if we pray for you and add you to our prayer lists? And I know others have done that. I know others are prayer warriors like Janet. You know, you can't get Janet, if you can't get Janet on the phone, she's either sleeping or praying. You're probably praying. We'll just go with that one. Why? Jesus. A Jesus encounter that transforms a life, that helps us and inspires us to teach children and to work with them and set up the top shop, try and figure out how much fruit parcels cost. Why? Because if our lives are changed, 
we are the contagion that changes the world because Christ lives within us. Brethren, the easiest thing in the world is to get people wet, especially in Scotland. The easiest thing in the world is for somebody to come into Christ. Adam kind of pointed that out with, again, Acts 2.38. I mean, God's made it so straightforward. The hardest thing in the world for the church is to get out of the way to allow other people to see Christ in us because we so often cover them up with our sins, with our complaints, with our problems, with our limitations. We need to get out of the way of that. Just like they did in Acts chapter 2. To allow the world to experience Jesus and to be changed forever by it. Because if we do that, the Lord will be adding to our number daily those who are being saved. God bless you. Thank you, Graham, for that lesson. Um, we'll sing uh, song number 376, You Paid a Debt, and after this song, we'll come, uh, come around the collection. Song number 376. He paid a debt, he did not owe, I owe to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace of the love. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid a debt at Calvary. afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to start out reading what's in your hymn, what's in the hymn book on page 742, or hymn 742. When upon life's billows now, this version has an extra verse than what, what's in the hymn book. Amazing what you find on Google these days. But when upon life's billows you're tempest-tossed, when you're discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the crust seem heavy you are called to bear? 
Count your many blessings. Every doubt will fly, and you'll be singing as the days go by. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy, your reward in heaven, nor your home on high. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So the question would have to be, how do you count your blessings? I mean, what are what are your blessings? And this is one of the things I looked up on the Google search blessings, and you get so many different opinions, possibilities. You know, from ranging from three different types of blessings to six different types of blessings seven blessings in the Bibles up to 80 blessings in the Bibles. So everybody has their, there are so many people with their different opinions of it, of, of what blessings are, you know. We have small blessings, mixed blessings, Blessings in disguise. You know, you give thanks for small blessings. You know, that's usually like when you have difficult times or troubling or something's happened. But you can still be thankful for the small blessings. Whether somebody gets hurt on an obstacle course and, you know, breaks the ribs and punctures the lungs. You know? <laughs> you know, the small blessing is that He's still here to worship with us. So whether people fall off ladders recently or prior, you know, a few years ago, like myself, you know, we are still here. And it's a blessing to, to still be here. You know, you have mixed blessings. You know, where something happens and, you know, you think it's a good thing, but other people might look at it as being bad. So you don't know how to look at it saying whether it's good or bad, you know. Yeah. The blessing in disguise. Yeah. For that right there, I consider it Emma to be a blessing in disguise. Because if it was for Ariana, then Just great book. Emma's here. Yeah, but when we count our blessings, you know, a lot of people will count. Go, well, thank you for my health. 
Thank you for the fellowships. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my finances. I thank you for the places, you know, that I live, my home. You know, those are all tangible blessings. You know, you're thinking for God's creation and the beauty around us, you know, the flowers, the trees, the sky, everything. And then you have the spiritual spiritual blessings, the blessings that you can't see, you know, that you can't see, you can't touch, you know, the salvation, spiritual blessings. I was going to have um, Graham play a song, but due to technical issues or compatibility issues, couldn't do it. And when I when I played the song last week, Emma told me. <laughs> Emma, Emma was like, "Papa, that's a baby song. You can't listen." <laughs> You, you shouldn't be listening to that. <laughs> and Jackie told me that if I played it, she'd walk out. <laughs> and, and Graham told me, he goes, well, you can read it. Well, I just happened to have it ahead of time that that was part of the you know, backup plan. Because if they get the message from Graham until this morning saying that he couldn't play the, the song. The song starts out, goes, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for the things I have. The thank yous never end. What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? Thankful for what are you thankful for? And then it lists a whole bunch, you know, for kids, babies, what they're thankful for, you know, we kids. But it's that one part there that says the thank yous never end. And if we look at We'll go to the Bible and look at Psalm 40, chapter 5. It says, O oh Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. I have tried to recite all your wonderful deeds. I will never come to the end of them. I mean, and that's, you know, part of the, the We Children's Song remind me of this verse that the thank yous never end because what God has done, you can never list everything. You don't have enough time in your life to list everything that God has done for us. You know, In Psalm 107, <clears throat> let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. You know, again, it's more blessings that we should be praising God, you know. Psalm 136 is all about giving thanks to the Lord and for the things that he's done for us. Give thanks to the Lord for he is for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods, his faith, love, endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Give thanks to him who alone does mighty miracles. Give thanks to him who have made the heavens so skillfully. And it, towards the end of the chapter, he goes, he remembers us in our weakness. 
He saves us from our enemies. He gives us food to, to every living thing. Give thanks to God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. You know, and some of the stuff that's written in here is stuff that we can actually see, you know, and touch on some of the things. But it's the spiritual blessings that we have, you know, that we should be more grateful for and appreciative. And Ephesians 1, it talks about spiritual blessings. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms, because we are uni united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gives him great pleasure. I mean, when we count up the blessing for this, how can we ever repay or give back, you know, to God what we're here for, you know, for the offering, for giving back what God has given to us? But it's hard to get back the spiritual blessings because you just cannot put a value of that on there. You can't measure it. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 16. Always be joyful, joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God, for this is God's will for, for who you belong to Christ Jesus. Okay. But I think the most, you know, there's so much in here that the Bible tells us to be thankful for. You know, and we sometimes when we count our blessings, you know, how often do we remember to count the spiritual blessings that God's given to us, not just the materialistic blessings that we have. John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I mean, that is probably the greatest spiritual blessings that we can have. You know, when I was looking through this stuff, I ran across this, this one lady wrote on one of the pages. She goes, when I go to sleep at night, I don't count sheep. I count my blessings before I go to sleep. I mean, where we come here every Sunday to give back a portion of the blessings that we have or that we were given to us. And, but what we can offer back to the church is nothing compared to what God has blessed us with. Adam, can I ask you? Okay. Take, take. Hey, how do you thank you for the Shepherd Lesson here and the presentation of the day? Father, we thank you for the soul to appreciate and do this. Father, at this time, we thank you for the mutual resolve and the safety of our gifts. We thank you for this opportunity. Uh, 
Our final hymn for this worship service is song number 490, as well with my soul. And if you are willing, please be upstanding for this song. And then please remain standing for the closing prayer. Song number 490. When peace like a ever attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord Thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It for the opportunity this morning to worship you. We pray, Father, that our service today is worthy of you. We give thanks also, Father, for all who have led the service today. Their words have been inspired and inspirational, Father. Above all, we give thanks to you, Father, for without you, we are nothing. We go our separate ways today, Father. We ask that you continue to bless us. 
give us opportunities, Father, to spread your word and increase your number. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.